Dr. Marcellino D'Ambrosio is with us from the Crossroads Initiative. You can find him, his resources, and information about his pilgrimages online at DRItaly.com. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, Anna. So August 15th is the feast, the solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. First of all, kind of an obvious question, what does it mean to be assumed into heaven? Well, I, I think... Um... I'll just mention that I, I used to teach college, and I taught undergrads for a while, you know, who had to take religious studies course. <laughs> and I remember one student said, oh, I, I asked the question, what is the uh, doctrine of the Assumption? And the student replied, um, now that's where um, the Catholic Church assumes that Mary is in heaven, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, not, I guess you exactly. can assume that. I, I suppose that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just an assumption, you know, when the Church... Um, canonizes someone, it, it's a declaration, an authoritative declaration, that a person is in heaven and it should be celebrated in liturgy and it should be imitated in life. And there's no one more to be celebrated in liturgy and, and imitated in life than the one who said, let it be done unto me according to your word, uh, the one who is the God-bearer, um, it, it, she, not just the mother of Jesus, but the mother of God. Um, Jesus is is man, true man. And so there's a tender devotion, I think, that all of us who are brothers and sisters of the Lord ought to have to our mother. But she also is the mother of God, which means she is the sacred vessel, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and, and, you know, the Ark of the Covenant was treated with incredible reverence and devotion by the people of Israel as the seat of God's presence. And so Mary, you know, has, has a special role in, in, of course, in Christian life. So her feast day, this is her quintessential feast day. Hmm. The assumption is the celebration of her victory. You know, she, she's a sorrowful mother who stood at the foot of the cross, and we celebrate in the assumption that she's also the one who stands at the right hand of the king. The queen stands in gold at the king's right hand, it says in Psalm 45. And this is understood prophetically to apply to Mary that she's a body and soul at the right hand of, of Jesus, as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Dr. D'Ambrosio, is there a particular reason why we celebrate this solemnity on August 15th every year? Well, I'm just going to give a little bit of um, explanation as where Saints' Days come from. Um, you know, the day the Saints' Days are all throughout the calendar in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox churches, and in some Protestant churches like the Episcopalian Church. But it's a, a strange idea for lots of folks who don't come from those churches. Um, back in the middle of the second century, around the year 150, there is an account that survives of the martyrdom of a bishop named Polycarp, a very holy man who is um, finally killed after uh, some, uh, some tribes that didn't quite succeed because of God's miraculous intervention. And his body is burned by the pagans because they don't want Christians worshiping him uh, as they expect they will. And it says very clearly in this account, you know, these poor people, how uninformed they are, how wrong, because they should know. We never worship anyone but Christ, but we do honor those who've given their lives for Christ. And so they mention how they gathered up his ashes and his bones, and they interred them in honor. And every day on the day of his birthday, his birth into eternal life, the Christians would celebrate the Eucharist there. And, you know, this is why Christians are, have the image of celebrating, you know, being in the catacombs. They weren't hiding in the catacombs in, in the 2nd and 3rd century. They were down there on the feast days of the martyrs celebrating the Eucharist mm. over their bones. And so, anyway, with Mary, the, the feast day, it really goes back as far as we can tell. You know, there's a lot of records that are missing, but August 15th, as the feast day, of Mary began in Syria and Palestine, and it goes back to the 5th century at least. So we just don't know how far back it goes, but from that time, it, it began to be, by the year 600, universally observed in the East. The emperor decreed that that should be the day, and the West began to celebrate it on that day as well. Mm -hmm. um, but a commemoration of Mary, of her feast, um, uh, it goes back even further, you know, for heavenly go glory, her birth into heavenly glory. Certainly. Now, the Bible does not record the assumption of our Blessed Mother into heaven, so how do we know that it happened? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it, it's pretty interesting that Mary's assumption into heaven is believed 
in the tradition very, very early and very, very widespread way, pretty much uh, became a, a universal belief in celebration. Obviously, if it's in the liturgy and the thesis, it was called her dormition or it was called her assumption, depends on where you go. Um, but but it, pretty much universally, going back to the 5th century or so, Christians believed that, that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. And there's a, actually an apocryphal account. When we say apocryphal, we mean that it's not something that's scriptural. And it's it, it contains perhaps um, true material, and it, it definitely has some legendary material in it, but it's a witness to, as early as the 5th century, a belief in Mary's falling asleep and assumption. And that goes, and that is located in the city of Jerusalem. That's the strongest tradition. Lots of folks have heard Ephesus, uh, but the strongest and oldest tradition of Mary's falling asleep and assumption of her body and soul into heaven goes, is located in the city of Jerusalem. And in fact, there's a tomb at the Mount of Olives. And that tomb um, is right next to the cave where the apostles slept while Jesus agonized in the garden. And uh, that tomb goes back again to, you know, 5th century or earlier. Um, big churches were built over it and destroyed, but you can still go to the crypt today where the empty tomb of Mary is. And that's an interesting little point. You know, no one really saw the resurrection of Jesus, although the empty tomb is, is clearly attested in all the Gospels. Um, Jesus was seen afterwards. He, he, he was seen uh, for 40 days. And actually, there, there may be a time when he was seen later, because Paul talks about an apparition of the risen Jesus to 500 or more brothers. And that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians. And it's an interesting parallel. Mary's tomb, there's a tomb of Mary that is empty. And there have been apparitions, credible apparitions, of, of the Blessed Mother since the third century. That's how, you know, the earliest recorded one. So, you know, there's a parallel between Mary and Jesus here, and that's just fitting because the mother um, follows the son. You know, she shares in everything in the son's life. And this is part of the theological reflection that goes on based on the scriptures um, and, and, you know, with, with a tradition in the background. It's, it's not the main point. The main point is reflecting on the teaching of the scriptures, that Eve died because of sin. And, you know, she, she began uh, immortal, you know, just like Adam, you know, in the story of Genesis. But through her sin, death entered into the world, and Adam's sin, of course. And Jesus is the new Adam. Mary is the new Eve, according to the, the fathers of the Church. This is even hinted at, really, a little in the New Testament, mm -hmm. um, in some kind of hidden ways, uh, like Jesus calling Mary a uh, woman. Mm -hmm. He calls her woman in John 2 at the wedding feast of Cana. Well, that, that's why does he call his mother woman? Well, that's what Eve means, the woman. And so lots of biblical scholars say, you know, this is a hint that Mary is the new Eve. And anyway, so in sharing in, in Jesus, um, you know, obedience to the Father and, and being free from sin, which is a unanimous tradition in the Christian community going back to the very beginning, um, she, you know, she shares in Jesus' triumph, you know, um, as the first one who shares in his triumph even bodily. And at the right hand of, of, of Christ, she intercedes for the needs of the saints together with Christ. So that's, that's kind of the meaning of this Feast of the, Ascen of the Assumption of Mary. Well, let me ask you this, Doc, kind of switching gears a little bit here. I mean, we're coming up on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation in October. Now, what did the original leaders of the Reformation think of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Well, that's a really good topic for another show, but I'm going to give a few, you know, hints here. Um, and that is that Luther and Zwingli, Zwingli is the leader of the Swiss Reformation. Um, he dies pretty quick, and so Calvin takes over. But Luther and Zwingli had a very um, much higher view of Mary and her privileges than most Protestants do today. In fact, they, they both believed in her immaculate conception. They both, they, the, Luther did not have any problem after the split calling her mother of God, mm -hmm. because really calling her mother of God is just saying that Jesus is true God and true man. If Jesus is God, then she is the mother of God. Um, and so uh, they, they, Luther wrote a magnificent um, uh, commentary on the Magnificat after he was excommunicated. 
And I'm going to say that I'm not saying here that Luther and, and Zwingli and Calvin had fully Catholic view of Mary in their doctrine, but it's much, they see much more important place for her uh, in, in salvation history and in Christian devotion than most Protestants do today. I think m- many, many Protestants are shocked when I show them passages from these guys, even after the yeah. split, regarding their approach to Mary. And I'm going to recommend a book to people who really want to know more about this. Um, it's called Mary, A History of Doctrine and Devotion. It's by Hilda Graef, G-R-A-E-F. And that book is a, it's a beautiful, it's understandable, but it's very in, much in detail with lots of citations from beginning with the Bible all the way through um, the middle of the 20th century, a history of Marian doctrine and devotion with citations of uh, the Reformers, the Protestant Reformers, and their views of Mary. All right, Doc. I mean, as you said, most Protestants today kind of have a problem with Mary, certainly not the, the level of devotion that the leaders of the Reformation had. How did Protestantism get to this point? I think really in reaction to what is perceived by many Protestants as Catholic excesses. And I think as Catholics, we have to say you can't really ever honor Mary too much, but you can honor Mary in the wrong way, which is to make her the center of things um, and kind of neglect Jesus. And this is what many Protestants are very, very fearful of. And I think they see some Catholics um, in their devotion as confirming this. And, and, you know, I think we just need to say there's lots of Catholics um, throughout history who have not been um, the greatest Catholics in the world. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I just want to say, I just want to say, you know, the best thing that we can possibly do as as Catholics or as, as also as Orthodox Christians or other Christians who see a place for Mary and have a relationship with her is to share with our Protestant brothers and sisters who are a little worried uh, just how much Mary leads us closer to Jesus. You know, her words, mm-hmm. one of the, the, the beautiful words that she said, she, she said two things that, that are very, very important. One is, let it be done to me according to your word. It's a surrender. It's an act of faith. So she's a model of faith, first and foremost. And secondly, she says, do whatever he tells you uh, that, to the steward in Cana. You know, and so Jesus is always going to, uh, uh, Mary's always going to reflect any glory given her in the Magnificat to God, and she's always going to point us to Jesus. So true devotion to Mary is just going to lead us closer to Jesus. And I think we need to share how that's been true in our lives. And I think that'll help uh, many Christians who are worried about this to relax and to discover the beauty of having a relationship with his mother, who is our mother. Amen to that. Now, going back to something that you said earlier, Doc, you said that there is a tomb at the foot of the Mount of Olives where tradition says The Blessed Mother was laid, even though there is, of course, nothing inside. There are no relics of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Is that a place that uh, you happen to go on your pilgrimages? Absolutely. We we always pass by that and and always say Deck of the Rosary in that place. And um, I'd love people to come with us to the Holy Land. Uh, We're going to be leaving right after Christmas. It's been uh, having a a wonderful 11 days there. You can find out about that on my website. We're also going to go after Easter, celebrate the resurrection over there. One last thing I just want to say is, in the doctrine of the Assumption, the Church uh, deliberately, Pius XII, who defined it as a dogma, he deliberately left open whether or not Mary died before she was assumed. And I'm just going to say that as a Catholic, you can believe either way, you're free. And he intentionally wanted to leave that that way because there are theologians on both sides. However, the ancient tradition and most modern theologians believe that she fell asleep uh, or died before her body was assumed. Hmm. So that just to let people know, it's, it's okay, you know, either way, to go either way on that one. And I know you've got a link to uh, that dogma, of the Assumption from Pius Twelfth, and that's all over at your website, which is? DrItaly.com, DrItaly.com. Yeah, come, there's great Marian resources there and information on the Assumption as well as on the Holy Land and a pilgrimage there. Absolutely. You can click the pilgrimage link at DrItaly.com. We'll have it linked at SunriseMorningShow.com. Dr. D'Ambrosio, always good talking to you. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you, and happy feast day. You too. Thank you so much.